<laughs> Might as well get started. Um, so this is sort of the plan. We're starting in on chapter 10, even though chapter 10 uh, is not covered on tomorrow's test. So let's talk a little bit about tomorrow's test. So we're on the subject. Um, so these are the rooms that the regular sitting is, is in. It starts at 610. Uh, so it means we will actually open the doors to these rooms probably at 6 o'clock, but no one's allowed to start writing until, until 6.10. So if you, you know, rush in at 6.09 in 30 seconds, you'll still have time to, to grab a seat and, uh, and sit down and write. Um, and then we, we also posted these rooms under the, the My Grades. If you're in the alternate sitting tomorrow, you should have already see, received an email about uh, what room you go to. You don't go to these rooms, you go to a, a different room. Just repeating a lot of the stuff that's already been emailed out to you. Um, the testable material, I'm talking about chapters, it'll be chapter six through nine, um, which is these classes nine through 15, so up to November 1st, uh, and the practicals four through seven, and those homeworks that are associated with each practical. So homework four was from practical four, et cetera, et cetera, and homework seven is included. And then also, when you're in practicals, you are doing some uncertainty stuff where you estimate the plus or minuses of your measurements using this PHY 131 uncertainty propagation summary. It's a one-page PDF that's, that's provided to you in the practicals. So that's also testable for the for the test tomorrow night. Yes. Um, what would be like just one multiple choice question, like the last time, or like in the actual? Yeah. The question is, um, will this be multiple choice? So. Um, the answer to that is the uncertainty stuff will, will only be in the multiple choice part. You won't do, be doing uncertainty stuff in the long answer written part. That's, what I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> uh, the format's exactly the same for test two as it was for test one. Uh, basically, there's eight multiple choice questions worth two points each plus to these free form problems worth six points each, for which you might, must write out your reasoning. Okay. You're allowed to get, bring you know, your handy dandy calculator. <laughs> programmable, programmable calculators and graphing calculators are okay with me, because you, you're allowed an age sheet, right? So you can write as much stuff on there as you can fit. You can write whatever you want in your age sheet if you want to write examples or solutions to pass tests or whatever you, whatever makes you feel comfortable. What, what I would do is just write down the equations that you didn't want to memorize. That's, what, that's what's, what is going to be useful, I think. Don't forget to bring your tea card as we're going to be walking around collecting signatures and looking at your tea card. I can show you the first couple pages of this test. It looks like this. <laughs> you know, just so you're not shocked. There's a bunch of instructions. There's the version code A or B. This was a version A. You know, it says use a soft uh, pencil for the bubble sheet. You're going to get a bubble sheet to, to scan trying in your multiple choice. We're only marking, only the bubbled answer sheet is marked for the multiple choice part. It doesn't matter what you circle on the question sheet. So make sure you, you're very careful about bubbling in the right answers there. And then if you look at the possibly helpful information for the test, I have things like pi and g and stuff and air resistance may be neglected in all questions unless otherwise stated. Uh, but I have a couple of equations as well. There's the uh, equation for gravitational potential energy of two masses separated by a big distance r. Uh, there's this, these collision equations, elastic collision where it's head on and um, the, you find the final speeds of the balls relative to the, the, first, the speed of the first ball which was moving. And then some definite integrals, so just a little integral table. These are the only integrals you might, you might do. I can put some little Harlow hints. Uh, don't be late. <laughs> it's important. You can be early. I would always spend the first few minutes just sort of skimming, reading over the entire test. I put my pencil down and just read the whole test through so I know what's coming. I'm not surprised by like the last page. Make sure I have the right number of pages, that kind of thing. Also looking for easy, easy problems to do first. Before you answer anything, make sure you've really read the question very carefully. The most common mistake is, is, not, is misreading the question. Manage your time. You're not allowed to bring in your phone. 
So you need a watch and not your uh, Apple watch. That also doesn't work. You need an old fashioned watch that doesn't communicate with other students. There's 10 problems spread over 80 minutes. That gives you an average of working about eight minutes per problem. So just you know, think about that as you're going. Yeah, you're not allowed to have your phone. Hopefully that's sort of something, you know? What else? This is my PowerPoint animation. I'm pulling down a piece of paper. Uh, some of the multiple choice questions are conceptual and can be answered in less than two minutes. So why not do those first and then it kind of gives you more than eight minutes for the longer problem, right? So I would, if you start a longer problem and you're working and working and it's 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15, you know, kind of look, maybe you should uh, skip it, circle it, <laughs> come back to it when you have more time. I don't know. Just don't get stuck on one question and neglect the rest of the test. Uh, bring a snack or a drink. You can bring a banana. That's what I like to do. A lot of snacks. Heck yeah. Just not, I mean, I wouldn't bring your whole lunch and stuff, but I, I definitely always brought something to eat because if my blood sugar starts dropping, <laughs> I get really dumb and it's not good. You know, I see a lot of students going, oh, I'm done, and they walk out early. I would never do that, honestly, just because I feel like there might be something that I could improve on. You know, I, d I, I like to use the time I'm given. And that's it. I had a couple questions. Uh, somebody was talking about this um, issue in Mastering Physics that uh, in last week's Mastering Physics, one of the questions involved the Greek letter rho, which very much resembles the lowercase letter p. That is correct, but mastering physics is extremely picky about this. It will not accept it. It'll just say wrong, wrong, wrong if you're trying to type a symbolic answer. And so the two ones that I have sort of circled here is just this fact that rho does not equal p and also omega does not equal w. You have to find this button right here, not that one, sorry, that one, and that drops down a little keyboard of all the possible Greek letters and then you have to click on click to put a row. This wasn't the question that the student was talking about, but you got the idea with that keyboard. It's going to come up more and more through the rest of the course as we get into um, you know, angular velocity omega and also um, angular frequency of oscillations for chapter 14. That's omega as well. You can't type a W, and no matter how many Ws you, you type, it's just going to be wrong. So be careful. Another great question that I had on the, this morning was, for the object moving in a circle, if the actual acceleration is not pointed towards the center, then how is the object still moving in a circle? Great question. Turns out that it's only uniform circular motion for which the acceleration is pointed towards the center. If you have non-uniform circular motion, like, for example, you did back in homework six with this um, block that was, do you remember it was on a frictionless globe or something and it was sliding down and you're asked for when it flies off the globe? That's an example of non-uniform circular motion, meaning the speed is not constant. And in this case, um, it's sliding down, so it's losing gravitational potential energy. So I think that when it starts up here, it has uh, you know, it's maximum gravitational potential, and as it drops down, it's going to be speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. And so, if it's speeding up, then it has two components to its acceleration. It has um, A sub T, which is the tangential component, and then it has uh, A sub R, which is the radial component. And A sub R is your trusty old equation V squared over R. Or, or capital R in this case, I guess. Um, but A tangential doesn't have a nice equation like that. It's just um, whatever it is. And, and there's this actual acceleration, magnitude of the actual acceleration is, uh, is from Pythagoras there. Basically, you're just summing up those two components. Okay. And it's weird because that the R direction is always towards the center, so it keeps on changing as the, as the thing is moving. And T is also changing as, as it moves. So that was a great question. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going on to chapter 10 stuff. Angular position. 
can be a little tricky, so let's go over it. Um, the way we usually measure it is if you draw an xy axis, you tend to measure the angle theta from the x axis. And so there's your angle theta. Your arc length s is s equals r times theta. This equation only works if theta is measured in radians. So we're going to start using the radian unit quite a lot. And the fact that we're going up from the x axis indicates that um, theta increases in the uh, counterclockwise direction. And that comes up, a question I get a lot from students is, why wouldn't you define clockwise to be positive since that's the direction that the clock goes? And I think historically the reason is that you measure from theta from the x-axis towards the y-axis and that happens to be counterclockwise. So counterclockwise in, these, in this chapter 10 is, is positive and clockwise is, is negative. And that's going to apply for not just theta, but also omega, which is the time derivative of theta, alpha, which is the time derivative of omega, and then the torques and all that stuff. So moving right along, we have angular velocity. So all of this stuff is mathematically the exact same stuff we were doing back in chapter two when we were looking at x and v and a is you have some change in theta, which is now kind of like your position. Well, we can, t and you have some time interval delta t that it took to move from here to here. I have a wheel here. So what I can imagine here is that we've got this wheel. It starts like this. What I'm looking at is actually the position of this uh, orange piece of tape. So I started here and then moved up like that. So that took some amount of time. If you take the limit of delta theta divided by delta t, you get the time derivative d theta by dt, and that's what's called omega. So let's also remind ourselves that this is the Greek letter omega. If you are used to calling it a w, that just means you're more likely to, to type w on mastering physics and get it, get it wrong. So, so now it's a good time to start calling that omega. Not that I care if you call it a W, I get what you mean, but mastering physics is not very forgiving. Okay, should we do a deliver? Okay, so I have a learning catalytics question for you. Let's imagine that you have a Ferris wheel where some seats are located halfway between the center and the outside rim. So for this circled seat, compared with the seats on the outside, the inner cars have a smaller angular speed and greater tangential speed, B greater angular speed and smaller tangential speed, the same angular and tangential speed, smaller angular speed, same tangential speed. So try to find the right one and try to remember that Angular speed is this omega, and tangential speed is that v in meters per second. So think about this, please. Try to choose your answer, and then I'd like you to pair up. It's a little sparse out there, but hopefully you've found a neighbor and just quickly may, uh, discuss with your neighbor. I'll give you a minute to think about that. So I believe the answer is C. Idea here being, that v tangential is equal to the lowercase r times your omega. And omega is going to be the same for all these objects. They're all going to sweep out the same amount of angle per time because it's a solid rotating object. So omega, same for all points on the, on the rigid body rotation. Rotation, okay? But this V tangential gets bigger and bigger. This, if you take R equals zero right at the center, well, then it doesn't have any speed at all. But as you get further and further from the center, it gets faster and faster. Okay. So that's the next slide. It's called rigid body rotation. 
which is showing uh, a couple of things. So as this object moves, it has tangential velocity, V sub t, that's this, uh, the green arrow. Um, but then it also has tangent, could have tangential acceleration and it could have um, radial acceleration. Okay, so alpha is the new thing here. It's d omega by dt. It's the, it's the time derivative of omega. And I think the easiest way to, to show this is to try to do a little um, plot of theta versus t. So what I'm doing here, let's try to do it. Theta starts at zero at time t equals zero. So I'll put it right along uh, the piece of orange tape right along the x-axis. So that's t equals zero. And then it gradually goes up and then slows down and kind of stops. <laughs> and so what happened there is that if you look at omega, the green line, well, it went to positive omega, then went to its maximum speed somewhere around there, and then it slowed down and stopped. Actually, it looks like it got up to its maximum speed fast and then slowed down after a longer period of time. <coughs> and then if you look at alpha, what's happening is that first there's some counterclockwise alpha acceleration, meaning that it's speeding up for a little while, and then there's some clockwise alpha, which is slowing it down. It's hard to picture all that, but it's very simple if you draw the graph, is that this green line is just the slope of the blue line, and this orange line is just the slope of the green line. Okay, and, then, and then similarly, I guess this is the integral. The green line is the integral of the orange line, and the blue line is the integral of the green line. You can go one way or the other. And then if you want to convert any of these angular variables, theta or omega or alpha, to the linear um, position or uh, velocity or acceleration, all you do is you multiply by r. r is a constant for any particular um, point on a rigid body as it's rotating around. And so if you take the time derivative, it just comes out in front and you get these very useful equations. These are good equations for the final exam aid sheet. Because they come up a lot. It comes up a lot too when things roll along because then what happens is that as it's rolling, this angular speed becomes the linear speed. And we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. So because the math is similar, the equations are very similar to what they were for, for um, chapter two stuff. So what I've done here is I've sort of shown all the linear stuff that we did before and then the new rotational analogy, same looking equations. If you have an x or a y, you're now replacing it with theta to be positioned. If you have a v, you're replacing it with omega. And if you have an a, you're replacing it now with alpha. But you can use all those same equations from before. The one thing that's weird and that comes up is the unit radian seems to come or go. And so this is a bit of a silly slide, but I've called the radian the magical unit. It's 57 degrees. But for example, if we want to look at what the units are for this equation, let's say we've got units. Units check for that equation, which you wrote on your age sheet. You've got VT. That is in meters per second. It's the tangential velocity. Uh, is equal to omega. Units for that are radians per second, and then multiplied by r. The units for r is meters, okay? So this should equal radians times meters per second. So if you do your units check, it actually looks really bad. It looks like the units don't work. But then a magical leprechaun comes along and just crosses this out. And then it's equal to meters per second, and that's good. So you do have the right units. 
<laughs> it just came out of nowhere. Where did the leprechaun come from? Anyway. I mean, it, it comes from this arc length thing. You're using radians because you get a simple equation for the arc length, which is that S equals theta times R. So just to try to remember from the context, when you're using SI units, omega is in, going to be in radians per second. And V is going to be in meters per second. As long as you convert to SI and always use radians, then you're going, you're going to be OK. And you find out the units from context. Okay. So these are the kinematics equations for uh, rotation. They're very similar to what it was before. Do you remember? Remember, what we used to have was something like uh, it was x final is equal to x initial plus a sub x times delta t. Remember that? Well, now I just went to Greek. <laughs> and I get this exact same equation. It's really useful. But now we're, instead of talking about something going along the x-axis, we're talking about a spinning wheel. That's when you go to Greek. Same thing. Remember this one? This one was actually that x final. Is it oops, wrong? <laughs> v final. Sorry. You guys got to yell at me when I do really dumb things. Or maybe they, you should be issued with tomatoes. Okay. Is that better? More sense? I've replaced the Vs with omegas. The um, Xs is what gets replaced with the thetas. Sorry for being sloppy. It was V sub I times delta T plus one half A times delta T squared. Okay. All I've done is, again, replace the Xs with thetas now. And this one was it was just that v final squared is equal to v initial squared plus 2 a sub x times delta t. No, oh, sorry, delta x. This delta x has now become a delta theta. Same exact equations, but now they're in Greek. And don't forget, the signs of the uh, delta thetas and also the omegas and the alphas are determined by counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is is uh, negative. Should we do a, this morning's pre-class? Remember this? I don't know if you can read it there. But when a fan, you guys did this, and 55% of you got it correct, so I thought I would do it myself. Omega, so when a fan is turned off, its angular speed decreases uniformly from, I guess, omega initial is equal to uh, 10 radians per second and down to omega final, which is 6.3 radians per second. And it says in five seconds, so your delta t is equal to five seconds. And you're asked to find the magnitude of the angular acceleration. So I'd say the absolute value of alpha. So what I'm going to do is look back at those equations, and I'm going to use, I think the one is going to be omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha times delta t. Is that it? And then I'm just going to solve for alpha. And so it's going to be omega final minus omega initial equals alpha times delta t. So alpha is equal to omega final minus omega initial divided by delta t. So it's equal to 10 minus 6.3 divided by 5, 10 minus 6.3, wait a no? Oh yeah, right, right, so front row is being very absolutely correct, it's 6.3, Minus, sorry, 10 divided by 5. It's negative 0 0.74. Uh, units are going to be radians per second squared. What I like to do is I like to not look at the units until the very end. I know I'm in SI at the beginning. I'm just going to work out all the numbers. And at the end, I'm going to look at it and say alpha. Oh, yeah, that's radians per second squared. Because the radians come and go. 
That's the problem, and it might not always work. I think it does work in this case, though. And then the one, the number that you said, enter the number only of your answer, is going to be 0 0.74 okay, in radians per second. That should be what you typed. Oh. Yeah, because it says the magnitude of the angular acceleration. It should have been negative, but it was asked for magnitude. That's why I, I think it, mastering physics required you to do a positive number there. What time is it? Okay. So let's go on to torque. And last day at the end of class, I showed that Hobbit door. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Do you remember me? This was about a week and a half ago. <laughs> I had something like, why is a door easier to open when the handle is far from the hinge? The idea here is that, remember how we have all these analogies of linear motion to rotational motion? Well, torque is the rotational analogy to force. Force is what causes things to accelerate along a line, and torque is what causes things to rotate or to change their, I guess, angular velocity. So if something's got angular velocity that's constant, zero torque. But if I want to slow it down, well, I have to apply a torque. That's what this friction does. If I want to change omega, I must apply a torque. And it turns out that torque is equal to the force times the lever arm, where the lever arm is some function of the distance that you are from the, the, the rotation axis, okay, the pivot. And there's an angle in, involved there as well. Uh, well, it's not quite the lever. It's the distance between your force line and the, the center. Anyway, if you're applying your force perpendicular to this radial axis, then the further your hinges, the more torque you'll get for, for an equivalent force. So that's, that's why it's good if you're going to pull a door handle. If the door handle is really close to the hinge, you won't have much torque and you won't be able to rotate the door. And actually rotating the door is what you need to do to open it. Because it's got a hinge. So just going back to our analogies, x was analogous to theta, v was analogous to omega, acceleration was ex analogous to alpha. Well now the force is analogous to the torque. And this, by the way, is the Greek letter tau. And then the mass has its analogy, which is called rotational inertia. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we have a Newton's second law analogy. The acceleration is the net force divided by the mass. If you've got a larger net force, you'll have a larger acceleration for the same mass. If you have a larger mass for the same force, then you'll have less acceleration. It's harder to accelerate not a big object. Similarly, we have the angular acceleration is equal to the torque. It goes up with it as the torque increases. And it goes down as the rotational inertia, which is like the mass of an object. I have another um, learning catalytics question for you about torque. This one is multiple choice. You can just choose one of these four forces. So what you're doing in this, it's a little difficult to picture it, but you're looking down bird's eye view of the door. So there's the hinge. And now what you want to do is you want to rotate the door to open it. Okay, so which of these four pushing forces would give you, they all have the same magnitude of force, but they're in different directions and applied at different points along the door. So think about which force you would like to do, and then pair up and explain to your neighbor why that force is the best. So that was, uh, that was really good. Most of you got that one. It sort of, sort of intuitively seems like F1 should have been it. And this was supposed to be folded out there. But basically there are, in this cross product dimension, R cross F, there's three important things. There's the magnitude of the force. Bigger force will give you a bigger um, torque if, the, if all of the things are equal. 
the distance from the point of application of the pivot, so that's why F4 is not as good as F1, is because it's closer to the hinge as R increases, your torque will increase. And also the angle at which the force is applied. If you have this force F2, then it turns out the lever arm is actually zero. The lever arm is the distance between the force and the pivot, force line and the pivot. If the force line goes right through the pivot, you don't rotate the door. Like you can imagine just pushing on the end of a door, it won't rotate it. And then F3 is an angle, and so once again, this force line has a smaller distance than the force from the pivot than the force line for F1. So that was pretty good. Um, and then this was a bit of a tricky one from this morning. Didn't go too well. If two forces of equal magnitude act on an object that is hinged at a pivot, the force acting farther from the pivot must produce a greater torque about the pivot. So um, you need to know the angle, I guess. The angle could cause, I guess that's, it's the must, the um, further force to have less torque. Example being that torque that was on the, uh, that force that was on the end of the door had zero torque, whereas that F3 that was perpendicular to the door but close to the hinge had more torque than the, than the end one. So that's, that's that counterexample. Comes up a lot in a wrench. Can we maybe show the, the demo? I brought a wrench. So just real quickly, this is a wrench. And this is the little nut. So when I want to tighten this thing, I'm twisting around. And I'm applying a force that is perpendicular to the end. If I apply this force right near the center, whoop, whoop, it's hard to tighten it. I can only tighten it that much. But if I am smart and apply the force out at the end, I can tighten it even more. And it's about as much as I can tighten it. Then the other thing I can do is get a bigger wrench. <laughs> and so I got a wrench that's this big. Got just kicked your table. And then I can really tighten and I can strip the whole bolt in here. So I can just put this on. So when in doubt, get a bigger wrench. There you go. And now if I push out here, I can really tighten the heck out of it. <laughs> or I can loosen it. Okay. So this is you know called working smarter, not working harder. Okay? Get a bigger wrench. <laughs> Okay. The effectiveness of a force at causing a rotation is called the torque. Torque is the rotational equivalent of force. There is even something called a torque wrench, which I happen to have one here, where you've got something that is twisting and then there's a big long handle. And out here at the end of the handle, the more I twist, the more the little spring measures foot pounds. And so the units of this equation are, this is meters, and this is uh, newtons, and this is dimensionless. This is sine, sine phi, and so the units of torque are uh, newtons times meters. Which is a little strange because newtons times meters is also equal to the joule. It's equal to um, the units for work. But that's a complete coincidence. The work comes from actually a dot product of force dot the distance and they're in the same direction. Whereas this uh, torque comes from cross product where they have to actually be in perpendicular directions. And they just, by coincidence, happen to have the same units. They're not related. And then this angle phi is the thing where if it's the angle between the force vector and the radius vector, where, the, where r is the vector from the pivot point out to the place where you apply the force. And so if, you're, if your force is in the same direction as the r vector, then phi equals zero. Sine of phi is going to be zero, and you'll have zero torque. Or if you have like we were doing with that door example, if you were pointing right in, then phi would be 180. And I think that uh, also sine of 180 is also zero. So if you're pointing right towards the, the door, 
then you get zero as well. That's sine. Just try to remember what sine theta versus theta is. 180 and zero produce zero torque. And in fact, the maximum torque is going to be for 90 degrees when your force vector is a perpendicular to your radius vector. So let's do this example. Lewis uses a 20 centimeter long uh, wrench to turn a nut. The wrench handle is tilted at 30 degrees above the horizontal and Lewis pulls straight down on the end of it. So you've got, just use this equation, R times F times sine of phi, where phi is the angle between this force and this radius vector. So there's your direction of R and there's your phi, so that's, that looks good. It's just going to be 0 0.2 meters times 100 newtons down times the sine of, and I'm going to say negative 120 because it's a clockwise direction there. And so I'm going to plug all that into my calculator, which right now is set into degrees mode, 0.2 times 100 times the sine of negative 120 degrees, and I get negative 17 newtons times meters. Okay. And that means that this is clockwise. So you expect that this nut, which is the object you're trying to turn, will rotate clockwise because of this torque. But they ask you for the magnitude, so magnitude of tau is 17 newtons meters. That's what time. I've got about 10 minutes. I want to spend the next 10 minutes talking about rotational inertia. We skipped through it pretty quickly when we were talking about the an analogy for Newton's second law for rotation. Remember that? Instead of mass, we had this capital letter I. That's called rotational inertia. And maybe if we just go to the demo here, it depends on the mass of the object and the distribution of the mass about the uh, axis of rotation. So I have a, one other demo. <laughs> Given this setup. And this is two masses on the end of a, of a pivot. And they're both at exactly equal distances. So what's kind of interesting is if I balance it, then gravity is going to pull the same amount of both. But what if I tilt it like this? I've got gravity pulling this way and gravity pulling this way. It still doesn't move <laughs> because the torque, this is pulling actually with a counterclockwise torque and this is pulling down with a clockwise torque. And so they cancel themselves out. Anyway, the point that I was going to make here is just that these masses, they can, you can rotate them in or out. You can put them close to the, the center in which case you'll have, it'll be easier to rotate it, or further from the center, this is the, sort of the maximum um, rotational inertia. As things move towards the center, your rotational inertia decreases if the mass is the same. Now let's go back to that. <laughs> Idea being, if you put the dumbbells really close to your hand and twist it, it's easy to rotate it. If you put them far away and twist that same mass, it's more difficult to change the angular velocity. So there's an equation, as there usually is. Looks a little nasty. But all it is, is you take the mass of each particle in your rigid body and multiply it times r squared, where r is the distance of that particle from the rotation axis. And you add them all up, and that's your capital I. So rotational inertia depends on the mass of an object. More mass of object more rotational inertia. It also depends on the distribution of all those particles. As, as R is greater, you're going to get bigger rotational inertia. And also, don't forget, R is measured from a rotation axis. So it depends on where you put your rotation axis. You will get a different rotational inertia if you put the rotation axis in a different place. And then if you have a continuous distribution of mass, uncountably high number of particles, you can replace that integral sign, sorry, some sign with an integral sign, r squared times dm. 
one more learning catalytics. Now here we have, be a little careful, two masses of mass M separated by distance capital R and they're rotated around the midpoint of the rod. So I didn't really put that on this diagram, but there's the center. So it goes like that. Versus object B, which again, they're separated by a massless rod. And now it's 2R between the two masses and the masses are half as much. Which one has the larger rotational inertia? Please think about it and tell your neighbor why. I'll give you a minute. Okay, that's it pretty well. It's actually dumbbell B, as it turns out. And the idea there is you've got here, the inertia is going to be uh, your little m times r over 2 squared plus little m, this is a, times r over 2 squared. So it's going to be m r squared over 4 times 2. So it's m r squared over 2. That's for object A. And then for this one, you've got, again, the same sum, but now it's m over 2 times r squared plus m over 2 times r squared, and you get m r squared. It's half plus a half as m. So this one's greater. Make sense? So for all these solid objects, you have this table from the textbook, which is showing that integral, the sum. So if you have all of your particles located about the same distance from the axis, r, then you have this equation that i equals mr squared, the total mass times r squared, because all the particles are at distance r. Sorry, this is r equals r. If you have a thin rod about the center, well, you have to do this. You can find out that i equals 1 12th. Now these are, of course, things that I would put on the final exam if you're going to have it as I list this. If you change and do a thin rod rotated about the end as opposed to the center, you get a bigger by a factor of, looks like about a factor of 4 of the rotational inertia. There's solid disk, which is 1 half mr squared. And then there's solid sphere and hollow shell. So a couple of quick questions. Will the rotational inertia be given on the, not test, but on final exam? On final exam, because it's not going to be on the test. Test is only goes up to chapter 9. Why does a hollow sphere, which is lighter than the filled sphere, have a higher rotational inertia? So this was a very good question, so I want to draw attention to it. The solid sphere has two-fifths mr squared, whereas a hollow shell, a ping-pong ball, has two-thirds mr squared. And two-thirds is greater than two-fifths. So how could that be? How could a ping-pong ball have a greater rotational inertia than a bowling ball? You just cut out the middle. So the answer is, it doesn't. Okay? If you just cut out the middle of a solid sphere, you'll have far less rotational inertia because it's based on mass. You take away some of the mass, you're taking away that rotational inertia. All those particles, remember it's just, rotational inertia is just the sum of all the mr squares of every little particle in the object. Okay. But if the mass is the same, which it wouldn't be, I guess, if you took out the middle, then these two equations apply. Remember that m is the same there. So if you've got a hollow spherical shell, that has the same mass as the solid sphere, it must be much more dense to have that same mass. And now that mass, same mass, is located at a greater average distance from the, from the rotation down the center. That make sense? So, I see you're getting a little restless. So I will say good luck tomorrow night. I'm back on Wednesday. Yes, there's a pre-class quiz on Wednesday morning, even though that's a little evil of me. Uh, something to think about, we're going to, on Wednesday, roll the solid disc versus the hoop and see who wins. So you can try to make a prediction of that. And I'll see you Wednesday.